Good evening. Welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. I'm Jerry Coyne, your host for the evening. And I'm an Emeritus Professor of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Chicago. Tonight, I'll be interviewing Richard Dawkins on his new book. This is it. It's just out in paperback in the UK. It's called, well, it might be reversed on the screen. It's called Flights of Fancy, Defying Gravity by Design and Evolution. Um, and it's a a uh, really great book. I've read it a couple of times, and it also has uh, some wonderful illustrations by Yana Lenzeva. So I recommend it for that as well. And in case you don't know Richard Dawkins, I'm asked to introduce him. <laughs> I think everybody on this uh, podcast will know him, but I'll go through the, the bona fides. Uh, he's an English ethologist, evolutionary biologist, and best selling author. Emeritus Fellow of New College of Oxford and was Oxford's Professor for Public Understanding of Science from 1995 until 2008. In 2006, he founded the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, now a division of the Center for Inquiry, which is sponsoring this video. So welcome and should you want to say anything? To <laughs> Thanks very much, Jerry. I look forward to talking to you. Okay, so we have the book. As I was telling Richard before the broadcast started, I've read it three times and I found it extremely enlightening because I don't know anything about flight as do hardly like most people. So I wanted to begin, this is supposed to be a question and answer, but it may turn into a conversation, which is fine. But I wanted to ask Richard this question first. Uh, this is a book about a single adaptation, flight. And of all the books that you've written, it's unique in that respect. And I'm wondering what sort of motivated you or got you inspired to deal with this? Well, it kind of grew. I mean, I, it was originally planned as, a, as just one chapter of another book. I, I wrote a book for young people a few years ago called The Magic of Reality, which uh, was about, it had a series of about 10 questions. But each question was something like, why, is the, why do we have winter and summer? Why is, what is the sun? What is an earthquake, et cetera? And so each chapter begin, began with myths and then was the, um, after the myth, myths from all around the world, and then there's the um, scientific answer to the question. And I thought maybe I'd do another volume of that. And the first question I thought of doing was about flight, and then it kind of grew. Uh, and uh, I got sort of so interested in it that it, it, it grew into a whole book, quite a short book, but, but it grew into a whole book. Um, yeah, it was, it, so you implied that it's sort of a, um, aimed at younger people, like teenagers? Yes, yes, I, I'd say teenage, yes, sort of um, 12, 13, 14, 15, and up to, up to 100. I mean, there's no reason why grown up shouldn't read it too. Yeah, I got a lot out of it. Um, there's a fair amount of science buried in this book, or not even buried, but explicated. So uh, I just wondered if anybody would find it tough going who hadn't heard of evolution before? Or was it designed to be given to kids who know, who know something about evolution to begin with? I hope not. I mean, I, I, I tried to um, explain things as I went along and, and the, those questions, that, and there's a, one of the themes that keeps recurring, as you probably noticed, was a, sort of the idea of economic trade-offs, which is an important principle. Um, and that kept on coming up. The, the book has, by the way, a size, which are printed in, in a different typeface, indented. Yeah, which are, which are, yeah that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, when they, and they, I think they all have the phrase, by the way, um, which is sort of an aside, which I think is interesting, but which is not actually necessarily about flight per se, but arises out of the discussion of flight. And some of those are about this economic theme and, and other evolutionary themes as well. Right. Uh, to, so when you're taking on a subject like flight, um, did you know a lot about it beforehand or did you have to spend an enormous amount of time doing research on this topic? I, I wouldn't say I knew a lot about it. I mean, it, it's pretty elementary. The, the, the physics there is, is not, you know, it's just high school physics. It's not, it's not advanced. Um, I had to do some physics because that's what flight's all about. Um, but um, yeah, I, I had to try to, I had to learn up a bit, but, but I think 
it's kind of high school physics really and and the biology is is something you and i know better anyway yeah the only yeah i mean the only part that was stymied me but you say it's stymying anyway is bernoulli's principle why air, air <laughs> yeah they're curved one way and you just basically say you know you don't want to explain it because it takes no well, i did i did explain it I, I put it at the end of the chapter i, yeah. I, I tried to explain it um I, I'm aware that a lot of people misunderstand it, and and I, and I sort of I talk to physicists, and they explain to me that a lot of people get it wrong and think that, that the way it works is that the you've got the curved top of the wing. Like, can anybody see my hand? Curved top of the wing and a more flat bottom of the wing, and the common misconception to say that a, that a, a molecule of air has to reach the back of the wing at the same time, whether it's going over the top or underneath, and therefore it has to travel faster over the top. Well, that, that's not the right way to look at it. Nevertheless, um, it's something close to the truth, it's something about the curvature of, of, of the wing. It's the same principle as um, the shower curtain gets pulled towards you by the downdraft of the, of the shower. That's why it's all peeled all clammy and you have to have a second curtain the other side of the bath to stop it happening. I mean that that's Bernoulli's principle, um, and um, but that's only a small part of what gives an airplane lift. It, it's mostly just straight Newtonian physics. The, the the air hitting the bottom of the wing, which is slightly tilted upwards. You get the same thing when you put your hand out of the car window and tilt your hand up. Up, you can't see my tilt, tilt your hand up, and it and it. Um, gets pushed up. Yeah, I thought that so was an just... example. Because so, everybody's experienced that. So. Yes. So when I, you know, when I asked myself, why did Rich write a book on a single adaptation? And then when I listed all the things, all the aspects of evolutionary biology that are contained within this book, then I thought, well, this is sort of the equivalent of Darwin's earthworm book, which is- well, That's a, a nice thought. I never thought of that. That's great. I mean, yeah. Darwin wrote on a specific animal at the yes. um, latter part of his career. But as Steve Gould pointed out, and I think this is probably true, um, the point was to show what had been Darwin's thesis his whole life, that small forces working over long periods yes, of time yes, can affect yes. great changes. So my guess was, well, Richard wanted to take a single adaptation and show how every aspect of evolutionary biology can be instantiated in that. I guess that was not your intention. But I, shall, I shall adopt that, that justification retrospectively, Jerry. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I, I, made, I made a list of some of the things that are, were topics of your other books that are contained within this book, and maybe I'll ask you to give an example of one of them. So there's the gene-centric point of view, which imbues the whole book, which of course is what you're probably best known for. Um, the idea of arms races, adaptive compromise, which you've just mentioned a few minutes ago, um, convergent evolution, step-by-step um, -step adaptation, which is the subject of climbing matter and probable, and the extended phenotype, which I believe is the book that you say you're the proudest of having yes. read. That, that's yeah. great. I love that list. And that, that is a list of everything that I kind of you know, re regard as important in what I've written before. Um, I can't, I'd have forgotten that all those came into it, into this book. But if they do, I'm delighted because... Um, yeah, like, yeah, there's more, too. I just <laughs> yes, yes. So... Um, well, I'll just ask you, well, we'll get into the mechanics of flight, because I'm sure that the people watching this don't know a lot about the evolution of flight or the mechanics of flight, but could you give us an example of uh, convergent evolution as instantiated in flight? Well, I suppose, I mean, flight has evolved in, entirely independently in, in insects, pterosaurs, birds, and bats, so that's, that's convergent. At a, at a gross level, um, and I suppose within um, within each of those groups that, that there is, a, and, and they've all done it in different ways. And, and um, if you look at the skeleton of, of those three vertebrate groups, um, they all use their arms as wings, which, which um, insects don't. In, insects' wings are outgrowths of the thorax, and it, so they, the limbs of an insect are reserved for walking. Um, but in birds and bats and pterosaurs, it's all the arm. In the case of the bird, it's the pretty much the whole arm is the 
um, main skeletal structure at the front of the wing and the stiffening of the main wing itself is done by feathers. In the case of bats, it's the outstretched hand. All the, all the fingers are greatly elongated uh, and there's a membrane stretching between all the fingers. And in the case of pterosaurs, it's just one finger. It's just the fourth finger, which acts as this enormous strut at the front of the wing. And the, and the skin, the membrane stretches to the, to the leg. Um, and um, so you've got the same problem of producing a, a wing using the arm as the, as the um, structure of it. And it's done in three different ways. And then in insects, the fourth way, where as I say, the insect wing is not a limb at all. It's, it's an outgrowth of the thorax that a part of the chitinous thorax, a totally different principle. And you say that, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but you mentioned that the latest or most well-accepted theory of insect wings is that they started off as solar panels, not as any kind of- Yes. And yes, that, that's, that's generally yeah. accepted now, is that? I don't know. I, I, I think it was when I read about it. I'm, I, I'm not sure whether it still is. Um, it seemed to be reasonably intriguing that, that, that they they started out as sort of flanges for for getting heat, getting en energy from the sun, and then um, when they got beyond a certain size for that, they started to become useful for flight. Um, it's quite. It doesn't. Struck me as totally plausible that, but but anyway, I wrote it down because that seems to be a fashionable theory. Yeah, I can't think of any other one. So. Um, yeah, so there's maybe I'll just pick out two more aspects, evolutionary aspects of the origin of flight that might be interesting. Uh, one of them, I mean, you say that it, that adaptive compromise or trade-offs is important or intrigue you, and then this is one way to do it. Could you give us an example of where in the evolution of flight that has come to play? Oh, um, no, I can't. Um, I, I, I'm sure I said it in the book somewhere. I just can't think of... of um, well, I, have, I can give you a hint. It's just yes. uh, the difference between uh, military fighters and more stable... Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, um, John Maynard Smith uh, had this idea of um, compromise between maneuverability and stability. And um, he, he was an aircraft designer during the war. He was an engineer and he gave up engineering after the war and went back to biology, went in, into biology. But when he was an engineer, he, he, he realized that there's this compromise between uh, maneuverability and stability. And an aircraft which has a long tail, like an early pterosaur, this great long tail with a sort of ping pong bat on the end is a highly stable aircraft, but um, uh, it is not very maneuverable. And if you shorten the tail and become unstable, then you become maneuverable and then you rely upon computer power in order to, um, uh, achieve the same result as you as you could with, with this with this long tail. Um, he gives an example of um, diptera flies, which rely upon the whole tail, the second pair of wings, which are no, which are no longer wings, but this little knob carry thing, which acts as a kind of gyroscope. And um, flies need that in order to achieve stability. That that's the computational part. They haven't got a long tail. And if, if the halters are cut off, I trust it's painless, um, then they just buzz around all over the place and they, they, they can't man maneuver. And if you stick a little um, tail on the end, I, th I think a fishing fly was one of the ones that was, was used, then they, beca they become stable again. And Maynard Smith made a contrast between early pterosaurs, which have the long tail uh, and, and they were stable but unmaneuverable. And then, and then later pterosaurs, um, which had no tail at all and um, must have relied upon uh, computational power to, to be, to, 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 to be um, uh, stable in the, in, in the air. Um, I suppose they must have had bigger brains, but it, it, the skull doesn't, doesn't show, doesn't seem to substantiate that. Yeah, we're sure these things can fly, right? 
I mean, the early birds, there are some birds like Archaeopteryx where I think there's some doubt about whether it could actually fly or not. But with the flying reptiles, they're pretty oh, sure. Bet, oh, yeah, they got these huge great wings. They surely must have, whether they could flap or just glide, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I'm sure they could fly, yes. Okay. I can't resist this, even though I wasn't going to ask it. But another example of a, um, a trade-off is the diving behavior of boobies. Do you remember that? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, say a few words. Boobies, boobies, which are which are gannets, and, and, and gannets are the same. Um, they fish by plunge diving from from height at enormous speed. They go. I don't know if, whether you've seen it. You've been to Galapagos, haven't you? Yes, Jerry. Yes, and you've seen the, there's this mass dive bombing of of, of boobies on shoulders. It's, a, it's one of the. It's a sight to see before you die. It's a magnificent sight, um, and they. They plunge at enormous speed and they hit the water and it damages their eyes. And so, excuse me, I've got to, I'm going to mute myself while I clear my throat. Um, and they damage their eyes and eventually they, uh, their eyesight goes because of this repeated buffeting of the water. As they as they plunge into, into the water, so this is a compromise. This is this is making hay while the sun shines. It's 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 surviving while you're young, at the expense of dying when you're old, which is what we all do. I mean, that's that's actually um, a, a, a reasonably plausible Darwinian explanation for why we age at all. The kind of trade-off between um, living to the full when you're young. At the expense of uh, getting uh, mortality as you get as you get older, and the, and the gannets is a particular example. Booby is a particular example of this because they 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 need to fish when they're young because that's the, when they're reproducing. They need to fish when they're young, so they're plunging and plunging and plunging, damaging their eyes all the time, and then finally um, go blind because they they can't can't um, see it any anymore. Yeah, this is one of the explanations. Yeah, you mentioned for senescence and organisms that there are random causes of mortality that make it advantageous to reproduce when you're young. I mean, in a yes. population where there was no mortality or no random causes of mortality, that wouldn't occur. There would be no selective pressure to reproduce when you're young as opposed to when you're old, right? I think there would, wouldn't there? You're, you're, you're postulating a kind of animal where where nothing there's, kills there's, it. There's nothing, <laughs> yes. Um, but even so, I think Peter Medawa, who first put forward this kind of theory, had a model of test tubes in a lab where any one test tube, it doesn't get any more likely to get broken the older it is. Nevertheless, sooner or later, it's going to get broken. Sooner or later, every test tube will get broken by accident. So it's even though it's no lo it's no more likely to get broken when it's old than when it's young, um, I think the the model still works that um, the any gene that mature that that comes to fruition when it's when you when you're young. Um, how does how does this work now? It's it's um, yeah. We're, we're all descended from animals, we're all descended from ancestors that lived long enough to reproduce and, and then died old. No, none of us are descended from, or, or, or we're less and less likely to be descended from, a, from an old ancestor than a young ancestor. And that's true, even if the animal is one like the test tubes, which, which are no more likely to be killed by accident when they're old than when they're young. I think, I think it does work. Yeah. Certainly Medawa, Medawa does, does use the test tube model yeah, it's uh, I don't find it much consolation in the ravages of age to say, well, that's just the way evolution. <laughs> no, I quite agree with you. Yeah, I quite agree. Uh, one more example, because I know that this is, well, maybe their listeners don't know, but Richard's been asked a couple of times over his life what book he's proudest of. And um, I would have thought it would be the selfish gene because it's wrought such a transformation in the field. But he always says the extended phenotype. Um, maybe you could tell us why did this press book, but also maybe you could bring in Hamilton's 
example of clouds that oh. relevant to light. <laughs> yes. There's an example of an extended phenotype. So. Well, I, well, okay. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it want the extended phenotype to stand or fall with Hamilton's wonderful way out idea of clouds. But, but I mean, the, the extended phenotype is just the idea that um, the phenotype of an animal um, is is the expression of the of the, of the genes. And from the genes I view, um, adaptations are um, natural selection favors genes that survive because they make good phenotypes. And mostly the phenotypes are part of the animal's own body, the, the wings, the tail, the eyes, etc. And that's conventional and that's fine. And that's, of course, what most of them are. But something like a bower bird's bower, which is in a kind of external peacock's tail, um, the bower bird. Um, uh, instead of having a peacock's tail, which, which in the case of a peacock makes it vulnerable to being eaten because it's less likely, less good at flying with a great big tail. The bowerbird has its external tail. It makes a bower out of grass and twigs and sticks and, and blue flowers and red flowers and beer bottle tops and decorations and things. And Lior's female seduces females by this beautiful bower. Well, that's an external phenotype, but, but obviously it's evolved by natural selection. It's an adaptation. And that means that there has to have been genetic variation in bowers. So a bower is a perfectly good phenotype, which is under genetic control in the sense that, that in the evolution of bowers, variation which was susceptible to selection must have been controlled by differences in genes. So genes can have external effects. That's an extended phenotype. In the case of an artifact like that, it's an easy thing to uh, accept. And then uh, in the extended phenotype, I go on to say, well, um, parasites that manipulate their hosts, parasites that an intermediate host, like a liver fluke, a worm, which is in a snail or an ant, say, and needs to get eaten by an ungulate, by a sheep or a cow, um, to get into its definitive host. And it manipulates the behavior of the ant or the snail, manipulates the behavior of the intermediate host in order to make the intermediate host likely to, in the case of the ant, it crawled to the top of the grass stems. The, the, the worm burrows into the brain of the ant, makes a lesion in the ant brain, just the same way that a, a, a physiologist might make a, a lesion to change its behavior. So the, the worm makes a lesion in the ant's brain, causes the ant to change its behavior and thereby become more likely to be eaten by a sheep. So the behavior of the ant is, is an extended phenotype of, the, of a gene in the fluke. And you've got to accept that because if it's a Darwinian adaptation, there has to have been genetic variation to be selected. And the genetic variation manifests itself in the form of and behavior. Well, parasites aren't always inside their hosts. Cuckoos are parasites that are, that are outside the host. And yet the same thing is going on. The parasite is manipulating, the cuckoo chick is manipulating the foster parent. I suppose so the, the concept of Darwinian medicine too, that when we're infected, that some of the symptoms we have are actually things yes. that help the microbe to perpetuate itself. Right? Exactly, exactly, yes. So in the case of the, yeah, of the cuckoo, the, yeah. the, the, the cuckoo is, is, is like the fluke in the ant brain, but it's, but it's not actually sitting inside the host. It's, it's sitting in the nest and it manipulates the host and makes the host feed it. And if you've seen photographs of a nestling cuckoo being fed by a wren, I mean, dwarfing the wren, <clears throat> obviously there's that powerful manipulation going on there. I've got to clear my throat again. Yeah, I, I always show that picture of my students um, as an example of, uh, well, the, how maternal instinct can be overcome by through manipulation. So the, the fact, the existence of zombie ants and things, I don't think we really know how these things affect the brain of their host to make them crawl up a stem of grass. But to me, that's one of the most amazing things in natural selection. I quite agree, there. I quite agree. Um, but however it does, however it does it, because it's, it's a Darwinian adaptation, there has to be genetic variation in the yeah. extended phenotype. And then finally, if you accept the, the 
the cuckoo chick is a few inches away from the host, then think about a bird that's singing uh, many yards away from the other bird that it's influencing. And we know that um, a singing male canary or a singing male ring dove actually changes the physiology of the female, actually makes the ovaries grow massively. I mean, dr dramatically, this has been shown in ring doves and canaries. Um, oh God, I bloody can. Since I had a stroke a few years ago, my, I, I keep meaning to clear my throat. I have to apologize for that. I'm muting myself. Um, so I, I regard something like a, bird, a, a male bird singing and influencing a female's ovaries. That's extended phenotype too. The, the variation in, in genetic variation in males is having phenotypic effect in the ovaries of females, in the behavior of females. So I see the extended phenotype as reaching out great distances um, from, I mean, from, from one end of a wood to the other, if a, if, if a male is heard singing and influencing a, f a female. So that, that's the extended phenotype. Oh, and then and Bill Hamilton's clouds. Um, yeah, this is that's, a the only bit that, that's the only bit that comes in the, in the book in Flights of Fancy. Um, Bill Hamilton, uh, of course, had wonderful ideas and, and most of them we now know to be absolutely correct and spot on. Um, but this one idea was that clouds, rain clouds are biological products. They're manufactured by microorganisms to get themselves spread around the world. And um, he thought that bacteria, microbes and protozoa, um, spores got into the clouds and, and, and caused, them, caused them to rain and um, uh, spread them around the world. It's, it's part of, the, of his theory of the Hamilton and May theory of the advantages of propagating your kind over a great distance, not, all, not putting all your eggs in one basket, all your offspring in a place close to where you are yourself. Um, the rationale for that is kind of, um, if, if you're a successful parent, you must be sitting in a pretty good place. And therefore you might think that natural selection would favor your offspring staying in that same place. Yet, because the world changes, because there are catastrophes, because there are forest fires and earthquakes and floods and things, the best place now may not be the best place in 10 generations time. And so if you imagine a gene looking back at its ancestral history, um, maybe its parental generation will be in the same place, but it's 10 generations back likely to be in a different place because of a catastrophe that, that might hit. Well, that provides the pressure to spread out about over the world, to, to propagate in it's far, far distance. That's why spores get sent a, a long distance away and so on. And so Bill had this idea of clouds. And um, should I tell the story of his funeral? Is that, is that a good thing to tell? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you know, Bill, um, wrote an article. Oh, I'm going to clear my throat. Uh, Bill wrote an article called My Intended Burial and Why. And he said, uh, when I die, um, I don't want to be buried. I, I want to be laid out on the ground in the Brazilian jungle uh, with a fence around me to keep scavengers off. And burying beetles are going to come and they're going to take me piece by piece, bit by bit, underground, because that's what burying beetles do. And then the following year, the adults will emerge and this blue wing beetle, this cloud of blue wing beetles will take off into the Brazilian forest and this will be me, this will be Bill um, flying around. Uh, he did it in a wonderful poetic way, which I can't re reproduce. Anyway, when he did die, uh, unfortunately, it wasn't possible to transport him to the Brazilian jungle. He was buried on the edge of Whiteham Wood, which is the famous um, ecological uh, research place near Oxford and his beloved 
companion, Louisa Bozzi, uh, knelt down and spoke into the open grave, um, something like, Bill, unfortunately, your body is lying in Whiteham Woods, but one day, the spores and the microorganisms from me will rise up into the air, into the clouds, and will spread around the atmosphere, and eventually, will be rain. You'll be rained down into your into your beloved Brazilian forest. Yeah, that must have been a poignant moment, I imagine. It so. was, and 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 the words are carved in a bench on a bench mm -hmm. by the side of Bill's grave. I, um, I visit the, Bill's grave every now and again, and it's still there. Yeah. I'm not sure the cloud, I mean, you say this in the book that the cloud theory for propagation of spores or uh, microorganisms is not widely accepted, right? It's hard for me to see how it would get started. Yeah, I agree with that. Individual, so, but it's a good yes. idea. But we yes. should probably get on to the sort of more well understood way. So you've explained already one reason why there's dispersal and flight, but it, you know, Another good thing about the book is you go back and forth between plants and animals. Plants have a form of flight, not only in the how the seeds disperse, but in the way they manipulate their pollinators to um, yes, recruits, which is, involves some fantastic adaptations. I won't ask you to describe them, but I, I think the reader should look up the hammer orchid. Is that what it's called? The and also the yes. bucket, bucket orchid. Yes. These are yes. They're almost as remarkable as the zombie ants in terms of how they manipulate uh, a wasp or a bee into trying to copulate with the flower by mimicking the, the wasp or the bee, not only the appearance, but the pheromones. <laughs> and then the, the wasp tries to copulate with the orchid and the orchid just slams it into the pollen. So the thing, you know, what, what I'm, you know, this is just one thing I thought of when I read that, why the, the hell do, does the, Wasp keep trying to copulate with orchids that it never <laughs> succeeds with. I mean, they think this would be a counteradaptive strategy. After you would, wouldn't you? You think they learn? Um, well, you know, Dan Dennett has this this word. He invented this word sphexish. Um, but after the, there's another another wasp called called sphex, and and he, and and it, it never learns. It, it, this is a, di a digger wasp which um, uh, hunts for caterpillars or something. And um, it it brings them to the to the hole that it's dug in the ground where it, where it lays its eggs, and it lay, it leaves the caterpillar on the outside of the of the hole and goes in apparently to check that everything's all right inside. Then comes out and takes the caterpillar down. Well, um, various experimenters have have moved, starting I think with with Fab, uh, have moved the caterpillar just a little bit. The wasp comes out, searches for the caterpillar finds it, and then again goes down to check the burrow. Um, and um, although it must, it should know that the burrow is okay because it's only just, just checked it, but this happens. Um, I, I think Tinbergen did it 40 times. And, and even in every single time, the thing was repeated. So it's just a mechanical thing. It's like setting a washing machine back to an earlier part of the program. And it just does it again, even though it ought to know the clothes are thoroughly clean by now, nevertheless. Of course, it doesn't because it's only a washing machine. Well, presumably, um, the situation where a caterpillar gets moved doesn't occur in nature. So that's right. No, that, that yeah, the same behavioral but, repertoire over and over but, again. But if if you try to to impute to the to the wasp something like a, a, a mammal level of 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 understanding or, or learning, it it wouldn't do that. Actually, I think it's an. I mean, if that's unfair because probably it, what isn't it's probably not actually checking the bar. It's probably going in, backing in, so that it can come out forwards. It goes in, turns around, and then comes out so that it can back in, back into the, to the burrow. So actually, sphexish is possibly an unfair adjective to apply to a wasp. But these, um, uh, uh, what are they called, drachea, um, um, the, the, the wasp we're, we're talking about with the hammer or orchid, um, yeah. they, it's unfair to expect them to learn um, that, that having been bashed over the head a dozen times by one hammer orchid to go and immediately get bashed over the head by another hammer orchid. Yeah, but uh, I mean, not even as a matter of learning, wouldn't you expect natural selection to select against those wasps? 
that will not copulate with orchids? Well, you would, of course, I mean, and you also expect that, um, the ordinary bee orchid, where where the, the bee copulates with the, with the with the bee orchid, you might expect natural selection to to weed them out as well, but it doesn't seem to have done. Yeah, so it shows that natural selection is not perfect. I mean, because they as, get as, nothing out of it. There's no nectar in these these flowers. I suppose we should move on. I, I mean, I can see that the time is passing much more rapidly than I thought it would. That's usual in these situations. But you've already mentioned one reason for flying, which is for both animals and plants, dispersal from a situation which might be good in the at the moment, but in the future would be bad. So dispersal to a new place and those animals that don't have a dispersal mechanism will not leave their genes behind. What about what other selective pressures are there for flying? Well, my, migration because of because of uh, climate. I mean, my, migration because of winter and summer, um, that because of because of the seasons. So um, enormous numbers of birds migrate huge distances. Uh, and and it's a great riddle how they do it. I mean, it, it's it's being solved, but 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 they they've got to navigate their way. It's even more of a riddle with with homing uh, homing pigeons, which um, uh, where, where they get transported by humans to some random place a long way away from home, and they and they get home. Presumably, the natural equivalent of that is being blown off course in migration by a by a side wind, and 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 you have to get get back on on course and so that probably is the darwinian advantage of of, of homing but the mechanism of homing is, is interesting fascinating well i think you say that it's not completely understood in homing pigeons because you could put them in a bag and take them anywhere and yes they'll, they'll find their way back and and what i mean how would they 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 do it in a beeline it's not like they're waiting around and looking at the sun yes i mean is it they do it. I mean, it, people have followed them with binoculars. Um, I think having released them from the basket, it's a long way from home, and then follow them out of sight and record exactly where they disappeared from sight with binoculars. And it is in the direction of home. So somehow they seem to be doing it. And there are various theories. I mean, when once they get reasonably close to home, they do it by landmarks, and that's okay. That's fine. Um, migrating birds um, sometimes follow coastlines, they follow river valleys, that kind of thing. Um, in the case of uh, night flying birds, they use the stars. And, and that's beautifully demonstrated by Steve Emlin um, in, in a planetarium, um, you know, manipulating the, the, the night sky in the planetarium and showing how the, how the caged birds, um, he had an apparatus which um, measured the direction that the caged, these were, these were buntings, indigo buntings, um, were struggling to get out of the cage, and they were struggling to get out of the cage in the direction they wanted to migrate. And he could manipulate that by changing the night sky of the planetarium. Beautiful experiment. Um, so, so that and, and they use the sun in in the in the daytime, taking account, of course, of the changing position of the sun as the as the uh, day advances. So they got to have some kind of a clock. Um, it's it's it, that's a place where theory is still working on it, I think. Yeah, I suppose if they're a creationist, maybe some people in the audience would say, well, animals can't possibly do that because they don't know how to tell time and they don't know what the stars are, you know? And so how can they figure all this out? And well, all, well all, all, all of us have an internal clock. All, all, even all cells have an internal clock. So they, they do have a clock. As for knowing the stars, um, what Emlin found was that they, um, he did a beautiful, elegant experiment to test the theory that what actually they, they don't have a map of the stars built into their, built in by genes. What they have is a rule which they use when they're developing baby ones growing up. They look for that part of the sky which during the night doesn't rotate. Um, and in the Northern Hemisphere, that's the pole star. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's a sort of patch of sky, which is where there would be a star if there was one. But, and so um, he did this experiment in which he brought up young birds in a planetarium, and he rotated the night sky for these young birds before they started, before they were ready to migrate. He rotated the night sky 
about, instead of Polaris, instead of the North Star, he rotated it about Orion's left shoulder. And these birds learned to treat Orion's left shoulder as though it was the pole star. And that's a beautiful experiment, elegant experiment. And I don't even, showing that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go, go, go ahead, go ahead. I was just saying, they don't even, I mean, they're not even, they don't even have the pole star. They use it as a landmark to do internal calculations to go in some direction relative to that star. Exactly, yes. Which is remarkable. <laughs> yes. As I'm yes. talking to you, I'm just realizing that this is a lot of this stuff instantiates how absolutely amazing natural selection is. That it can yes, be it really is. in a, the brain of a bird that's not much bigger than a, a pencil point. I mean, hummingbirds go across the Caribbean in one go, as far as I know. They and, do, yes, yeah. So, okay, uh, so, you know, you you describe in detail about, you know, all the different advantages of flights and dispersal for plants and animals. Um, and you give the various scenarios for the evolution of flight. One of them is called the, well, in, in birds, it would be the trees down or ground up scenarios. Um, I guess we should probably describe those because they're so important and controversial. I just wonder yes. which one you adhere to and why. Well, the creationists, of course, are very keen on, on the question, what is the use of half a wing? And, and um, because uh, they, they like to think, well, it's all very well having a whole wing. Once you've got a whole wing, then you can fly. But, but what's the use of a little wing stub? And we can see easily how that could work with these gliding animals. The, the forests of, tropical forests especially, are filled with animals that glide. Squirrels, for example, flying squirrels in Africa and Asia and marsupial equivalents in Australia, which have a, a membrane stretched from the front legs to the hind legs. And they don't exactly fly, but they glide great distances, maybe a hundred yards in the forest. Uh, and it's very easy, I think, to see how that could evolve because an ordinary squirrel without any kind of membrane there will leap from branch to branch. And however far a squirrel can leap without a membrane, it can leap just that much further with a, with a slight membrane, with a, very, with a very stubby, very small bit of membrane. And then once you can leap that much further, then you can leap a little bit further still with an even bigger membrane. And so up in the canopy, there's a whole range of different distances between branches and there's always got to be one branch which you can just reach with a little bit of membrane which you couldn't reach if you didn't have that little bit of membrane. And so as each step in the evolutionary progression is, takes place, as each increment in the membrane is added to the previous one, the squirrel can leap just that little bit further. And so, as I say, we have we have various kinds of, of, of um, flying squirrels, so-called, the, the colobo, the so-called flying lemur. There are flying frogs, there are flying lizards, and then there's the marsupial equivalents. Um, and so maybe bats evolved from something like that. Maybe bats evolved from, by, this would be the trees down theory. You have animals that live in trees and they leap from branch to branch, they glide, and then you go through the stage like the flying squirrels of gliding great distances. If you watch a flying squirrel or a marsupial equivalent of flying phalanger, they kind of move their limbs as they fly. And so they're kind of steering and they, and they come to, they, 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 they land quite gracefully. Um, so they have some control. It's not that difficult to see how you go from that to flapping, no, and staying up indefinitely. Yes. Laughing. So um, I guess they, that's the trees down. That, that's the trees down, which I find very plausible. Um, for, 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 maybe, for bats? Maybe, for bats, I, I would have thought for birds too, but, but um, especially for bats maybe. For birds, some people prefer the, the ground up theory, which is the, the idea that well, birds are dinosaurs, as you know, and um, um, they, um, the, the ground up theory would be something like dinosaurs running along hunting, maybe hunting insects, leaping in the air to catch insects. Um, and, and the higher you can leap, the more insects you can catch. And so something like the trees down theory might apply there. They, you, you develop a bit of membrane, a bit of, and actually there would have been feathers in this case if it's birds. Um, uh, many dinosaurs had feathers. Uh, and so using yeah. feathers to increase the- 
Yeah, they were there. The feathers were presumably there for insulation. The feathers started for insulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you just enlarge the feathers because they provide a little bit of lift, a little bit of, of aerodynamic um, power to get, to get up, to just a little bit, bit higher. Think about um, cats leaping to catch, catch um, birds in the air, for example. They can leap really very high. Um, and so with a little bit of flight surface, they could leap even higher. So that would be one version of the, of the ground up theory. Another version is, is pouncing an ambush predator that, that pounces and can pounce a, a bit further um, if it's ambushing behind a rock and it, and it waits for prey and then pounces with a bit of flight surface, you can pounce a little bit further. So that's another version of the, and then of the there's up theory. Brush turkey scenario, which I find the least plausible. Absolutely, yes, we're running up a tree. <laughs> yeah, the, the young ones apparently run up trees and they use their <laughs> yeah, wings yeah. to help them do that. And that could yes. be the recipient adaptation. Yes. Well, so there, anyway, they, there's, there's no, shortage of, there's no yeah. shortage of theories for how flight could get started. But I guess the general answer to the question of, of what our use is half a wing is, it's better than a quarter of a wing. Exactly, exactly, yes. Yeah. All right, well, we're sort of running out of time, but I did want to ask you about your next book, which sounds quite interesting. I've seen bits of it, but uh, since, uh, when will it be out and what will it be about? Oh, I don't know, it, it's not finished. I've written about 67,000 words. It's called um, The Genetic Book of the Dead. And, um, the, the idea is that um, an animal is a description of ancestral environments in which natural selection shaped its ancestors. So you can read it as a description. And the, the obvious examples of these are things like camouflaged animals where they have the environment painted on their back. So a desert, a desert lizard has sand and pebbles almost literally painted on its back. And what I'm trying to say is that there's no reason why such, in, such detail of environmental description should be only on the skin. It must go right through the body. Every bit of the body, every detail of the body, every bit of the, of the warp and woof of the interior of the animal must be a description of the environment in, this, in, in the same way, but less obviously so, as the painting of the environment on the back. You're talking, so You're talking about uh, the DNA sequence. Sorry? You're talking about the Yes, and, and the DNA, I mean, the, a biologist of the future will be able to, to, to read the DNA and read that as a description of, um, but that, that really can't be done yet. And I think that that's a, a, a prediction for the future. Yeah, I just wondered that. I mean, to me, that's interesting, the DNA thing, but um, we'd have to know a lot about developmental genetics before we could even start. Of course, exactly, and, yes. And the other thing I worry about with the DNA thing is uh, the organism is a palimpsest, so each environment that its ancestor experienced would be dna on top of the previous one, so that might render, you know... Yes, kind of well, on. palimpsest is one of the commonest words in the book, and, and, and yeah. so that the whole thing is, a, is about palimpsest, yes, you're right. Okay, um, well... I think we should get to the questions because we have about 12 minutes left. I'll pick out some, but let me just ask you one more question, which is, um, what would you, a young reader who reads this book, what would you like them to come out knowing? I mean, knowing about, oh. food, of course, but uh, broader lessons? Oh, the power of natural selection. I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 the beauty of it and the, the, the elegance of it, and the immense power to, to simulate design. It looks yeah. exactly like like design. Yeah, I, I, I won't. I wasn't going to get to this, but I, the subtitle of the book is "Defying Gravity by Design and Evolution." So Richard talks about not only animal, you know, design, designoid features. I guess talking, uh, sorry, Dan Dennett would call it, but also humans and how they're parallel to each other. I worried a bit at first that you know, intelligent design people would say, "Well, there you go." <laughs> the animals are showing the signs of exactly what humans do when they design an airplane. Yeah. You do dispel that quite well in the book by pointing out the differences. For one thing, that animals, the evolution has to be gradual and has to be adaptive in every stage, whereas in humans, you can completely redesign something from scratch. That, that's a big difference. You can go back to the drawing board, and, and that's what the yeah. one thing that natural selection cannot do. It's got to make do with what's already there. Yeah. It does an amazingly good job given that limitation. Yeah, 
I mean, I guess the last, it was, is it Orville's rule? Natural selection is cleverer Clever than, than you are, yes. Yeah, yes. I love that one. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, let me look at a few questions here. Um, Uh, there's quite a few. Um, some of these are political. Well, okay, well, this is a personal question, but it's relevant, I think. This is, uh, this is for somebody I know, actually. Richard, you mentioned the evolutionary pressure that weights productivity towards younger people, reproductive productivity. Can you give us some insight as to how you're managing to stay so productive regardless of the aging process? What kind of routine enables you to can, can keep up your productivity? And this is a question okay. I wondered about too, so. Um, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, um, I, I guess I'm just enthusiastic about it and, uh, and um that sort of keeps me going. I, I, I just, you know, I'm just so absolutely fascinated by the power of natural selection. And I just want to keep talking about it and writing yeah. about it and learning about it. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, this is a question that I wanted to ask you. Um, and it came from one of your friends, Ian McHugh, and I read something where a reporter asked him, well, what is your work habits? How do you manage to turn out book after book after great book? I'm pretty chaotic. I, it, it, I, I don't have a kind of rule that I get up at a certain time and write a thousand words before breakfast or something. It's, I have spurts when I do a lot. And at the end of the day, I've achieved a hell of a lot. And then for the next week, I achieve nothing at all. So I, I don't have a very good routine. So it's more or less when the mood strikes you to write. I'm afraid it is, yes. And I yeah. never know where it's going to be. And one question about style, this is my personal question, because of course all of us aspire to write with the grace and a line that you do, although we can, but uh, the, is your first draft of your prose, is that what makes it into print or do you have to extensively rewrite? I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite over and over and over again. And, and that's mostly what I do. And I, and I, and I reread it um, through different people's eyes. I, I, I kind of imagine different people reading it. And then every time I read, it's kind of natural selection process. It, 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 it gets, it gets through, it goes through a kind of Darwinian winnowing process, having been read through different imaginary people's eyes. Okay, it's hard to discuss. And, um, well, this is one I read before. Is it says, so there's lots of examples of flight evolving independently, but, this person doesn't know any examples of loss of flight. And oh, you talk yeah, about that, so. yeah there, there, there's a whole chapter which is called, um, if flying is so great, why do so many animals lose the power of flight? And, and it's, it's very true. And, and things like dodos uh, and um, islands, especially all over the world, there are island species of bird which have lost the power of flight. Their wings have shrunk, they no longer fly. Um, and um, it's probably because there are no predators. And so they don't have to run away from, they don't have to escape from predators. They can just take life relatively easy. And that's almost certainly the case with dodos. Um, in the Galapagos flightless cormorant is another nice example. Um, there, are, there are lots and lots of these. Um, even the, the, the great flightless birds like ostriches and emus and elephant birds, extinct elephant birds and moas and, and terror birds, they probably originally started on islands, I would imagine, but a very, very long time ago, in the case of the ratites, the ostriches and emus and, and, and rheas, um, they, they evolved very early in, in the evolution of, of birds, but probably on islands, I would think. Well, the most dramatic just, example, sorry. I was just thinking, I mean, I learned the other day that I thought the ratites were flightless. I mean, because they're all, they're all, a clade. They're all related to each other. Ostriches. Yes, they are. Yeah. But they independently lost their flight in different places. And I'm just wondering what in that group predisposed them to lose their flight. You know? I think it's so long ago. They, they evolved very, very early. I'm not sure whether, whether we know, know enough about that. Um, I think there has been some molecular work, which is uh, which we discuss in the ancestor. So I've forgotten what the details are, but it's, it's quite surprising. If you look at the molecular taxonomy of ratites, um, it's 
quite revealing, but I can't remember what it reveals. It's, it's in the ancestors' table. Anyway. Well, that, that they lost their wings, and apparently it's one of them. Uh, here's a question about humans, which touches on the subject of evolutionary psychology. And we know how uh, inflammable that is, but I'll ask it anyway. If the song of male birds can affect the size of the ovaries of female birds, can the same be said of the voice of human males or human females? And then there's a parenthetical remark. One only has to see the sexual hysteria of female fans at an Elvis or Beatles concert to see this in action. I'm going to dodge that, right? but I'm going, to, I'm going to travel. If you start talking about humans, it, it, you get into all sorts of hot water. Um, but, it, but what I do think is interesting is that um, um, Keats is owed to a nightingale. Uh, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though hemlock I have drunk. Um, I can't remember how it goes on. I emptied some um, dull, or something like anyway. Uh, Keats was drugged by the nightingale song. Yeah. Or claim, claimed to be. And um, I would think that we could say that female nightingales might be drugged by nightingale song. Um, one of the, my, the extended phenotype approach to animal communication would regard um, the singer as a manipulator of the singee, a, a singer of the a manipulator of the, of the recipient. And um, I think it's just like a drug. It's just like a, either a drug or a, a, a physiologist making a lesion in the brain. A male bird might like to make a lesion in the female bird's brain. A male bird might like to inject hormones into the female. And we know that that's effectively what the song does in canaries and bow cooing and ring doves. So I think that since Keats's brain was a vertebrate brain, similar to the brain of a female bird and they're both vertebrate brains, I think that the, the power of a, of a nightingale song to drug Keats how much more would be the power of the nightingale song to, to drug another nightingale? And so that's, that's as near as I'm going to get to, to, to humans. I mean, is there, is, there is something I've heard that the, the deeper a male's voice is in humans, the more attractive that male is. Um, I don't know if well, you've, got, you've got a nice deep voice. So you know, like that's, that. why, that's why I know that because I've been told that before, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't publish it. That's all I can say. <laughs> Uh, there's time for one more question. Um, this is a, a good, an interesting one. Given natural selection must evolve from what is there already, are there designs that cannot be evolved? Well, I no animal I think has ever evolved a wheel. I thought there was um, one. That would, that's my first thought, but I thought yeah. a wheel would be something that where there's something that's completely physiologically yeah. Well, the, the bacterial flagellum is is has an axle which 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 goes round and round and round continuously. It's got a little a little motor, mm -hmm. um, which, and it and it rotates continuously. So that's a beautiful example. That really is an example, um, and that's possible because it's so small. But um, <clears throat> a large animal, the sort of animal you can see, um, the the wheel is. It's very hard to imagine how it would get its blood supply and, and its nerve supply and things it would get twisted around the axle. Yeah. So um, I, I think a wheel might be a good example. Um, there, there, are, there are some nice examples of things that have only evolved once, I think, but, but well, language has only evolved once. Yeah. I was just remembering, wasn't it? All day in there, he was asked if humans could ever evolve into angels. And he said they, need, they had neither the, the wing buds nor the moral capacity to do that. Yes. <laughs> I Sounds anyway, like very in. Yeah, great guy. Um, so we're at the end of our hour. And I'll just remind you that the book we're talking about is Flights of Fancy, Define Gravity by Design and Evolution. It's just out in the UK and paperback this week. And you can get it as, as I've gotten it in the US on Amazon. And thanks a lot, Richard, for joining us. Thank you very much.